Hi, and welcome back to the Shame Plays Notes series on Tomb of Annihilation, which is the 5th uh, edition romp through uh, the jungles of Chult and a, a nice big nasty dungeon that is an homage to the Tomb of Horrors from way back in the day. This is episode 12. Today I'm joined by uh, my kitten familiar, my cat familiar, Buster. He's decided here lately that he likes the back of my chair. So... Um, he may occasionally snore, which I think is adorable, but your mileage may vary. Okay, uh, so at the end of last uh, update, the PCs had just um, finished Curse a Ball, or at least talking to the Aarakocra at the monastery, the ex-monastery of Curse a Ball, and Teacher, the lead... Aarakocra had sent them on a mission to Nangalore uh, to find a black orchid to prove their metal. So let's pick up there. Uh, first, let's look at um, rules clarifications and viewer feedback from video number 11. I'm going to put my plus three spectacles of rules clarification and viewer feedback or viewer feedback and or rules clarification, however you want to say it. Um, so here we go. Benoit M said, thanks again. We'll be playing part two of Curse of All tomorrow. It was good timing for him. Playing the princess similar to the mother of dragons in Game of Thrones. Wow. Um, I didn't play it that way, but you certainly can if you want to. Uh, of course, the princess from uh, Mother of Dragons ended up being a crazy, crazy dangerous woman. So... Well, actually, to be fair, a lot of people in Game of Thrones are crazy, crazy dangerous people. Uh, and then, then he followed up and said it went well. Um, now entering level three of the tomb tonight. So there's some time had passed between our comments. Uh, he said he's also nearing uh, the end of Out of the Abyss with his other group after two years. Yeah, that's a long campaign. So is Tomb of Annihilation. Just finished... The mage and maze engine next Zuckmoy's wedding. Still using your out of the abyss session series for prepping ideas, and that's great. Um, I love that. Uh, out of the abyss is just man. That video series has had legs. I, I still get all kinds of comments that people find it useful, and, and I love that. So uh, Benoit also says he added a combat at Curse of All as they were making their way to the top. A dozen gargoyles from Omu as well as minor earth elementals, uh, which he used from D&D Beyond Homebrew, that broke from the cliff side. That's cool. So you're climbing the cliff, and these earth elementals break out of the side of it. Uh, five or six era coker came to the PCs to help mid-battle, uh, using the mob damage generator online, about 15 damage per round against the enemy. I'm not quite sure what Benoit is talking about there, but I'm assuming it's you just if you have a mob of creatures, you just figure out how much damage it would do each round instead of rolling for each one to make things faster um, using some sort of online tool. When half the foes were defeated, they fled. It was our session's battle after they finished exploring Mesro using the Dungeon Masters Guild Adventures League su supplement. So that's something different. I have not taken my players to Mesro. That's a an additional supplement. Looks like you can get at the DM skill. So, um, and I, you know, when I commented, I was like, I love the Earth Elemental coming out of the cliffside. Yeah, that's that's a great. It's like you're like, oh, I'm on a cliff, and all of a sudden the cliff's like, I'm going to attack you, and you're like, ah. So anyway, um, Mega Abduck Loser, Abduck Loser. I don't know. Uh, I, I assume I'm saying that right. Very informative. Thanks for the upload. Uh, very, very glad to do it. Thanks for watching it. Mega Abdok Loser. And then Sonic Halo, who is no stranger to the series, said nothing to say. Just come, just come in to boost the algorithm for you. And I really appreciate that. Appre uh, appreciate that. Appreciate that. You know, I don't, I, on all my, my podcast videos, all that stuff. Stuff I put on YouTube. I don't. I don't beg for a lot of stuff. Occasionally, I mention there's a Patreon, and there there is a Patreon you can find in the show notes uh, for this video. I have, a, I have two Patreons: one for my videos, one for my podcasts and blog and stuff. Um, 
And, you know, like I said, I don't constantly, hey, you know, give me money, give me money, give me money. But if you can, if, if somebody just gives a like or even a thumbs down, a thumbs up, thumbs down, a comment on a video helps it a lot. So you don't have to, you don't have to, subs or, you know, or subscribing to the channel or something. You don't have to give money to help creators. Something as simple as leaving a comment saying, oh, I liked it. When the YouTube algorithm sees how many comments there are on a video, they consider that interaction, which helps it shows up in, in search results. So thanks again, Sonic Halo. And that was a wonderful opportunity to mention that. All right, true believers. One thing I forgot to do yesterday while recording the video was welcome a new uh, patron supporter and that is Johnny now I've known Johnny for a long time and a really long time probably one of my oldest friends and I appreciate his support and his haiku relates to a song this is a cat and this is a cat relates to a song that we used to sing back in I was in high school he may have still been in junior high I can't remember um, but it, it goes a little something like this <clears throat> me, 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 me. bring back Bring back, bring back my Buddha scratcher to me, to me. Bring back, bring back, bring back my Buddha scratcher to me. So that was the stirring rendition of bring back my booty scratcher to me. And here is uh, Johnny's haiku. My booty scratcher, please bring it back with much haste. This bum once scratched stat. So thanks again, John, for your support. Uh, all of the uh, Patreon support that I get, I appreciate, of course. And if you, uh, there's various levels of support, but uh, I, I will, I do custom haikus for my Patreon supporters and read them on videos. So it's it's a lot of fun. But anyway, there you go. Let's let's hear that one again because it's so good. My booty scratcher, please bring it back with much haste. This bum once scratched stat. All right, back to the video. So um, let's see. Let's look at some uh, rules clarifications here. Rules notes, we should say. Um, the main one that came up, and it, and it may this may seem kind of weird, but sometimes you have to remember that D and D is a system of rules not a perfect simulator that covers every possible scenario in life or fantasy as it is um, identifying spells uh, or not not identifying spells identifying scrolls so you you find a scroll in loot or, or whatever and you want to identify it. Well, if you're a magic user, you can't just flip it open and go, okay, this is what the scroll is. Um, it, it's a magic item. It's considered a magic item. Look at the Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, it is considered a magic item, not a special, unique subclass of magic item. So you still have to uh, either cast identify on it or you have to um, use a short or a long rest and fiddle around with it to figure out what it is so um, it's not they don't have their special rules even though it seems like you should be able to just oh well I I'm a magic user and I've got I know how to read spells already so I should just be able to say, oh this is a you know maybe maybe it's just the different uh, there's enough difference in how different magic users, wizards, sorcerers, clerics, or whatever, write down the spells that you got to spend a little bit of time figuring out. I don't know. But scrolls, magic scrolls are considered magic items, and there are specific rules for identifying a magic item. And, you know, I was looking through the Dungeon Master's Guide. I was looking online. I didn't see, uh, you know, any any special rules for identifying a scroll so if, if something's that now I'm not talking about homebrew I'm not talking about some you know supplement on the DM's guide but if you see something in the core rules that's different you know please correct me so because it feels like that they should have their own rules for identifying but I didn't see that so you know at least not in fifth edition 
So, all right. Uh, so the next thing is on locate object. Um, locate object is you have to know what you're looking for. So let me read the thing here. It says describe or name an object that is familiar to you. Uh, you sense the direction of the object's location as long as that object is within 1,000 feet of you. If the object is in motion, you know the direction of its movement. A spell can locate a specific object known to you as long as you've seen it close up within 30 feet at least once. Alternately, the spell can locate the nearest object of a particular kind, such as a certain kind of apparel, jewelry, furniture, tool, or weapon. This spell can't locate an object if any thickness of lead, even a thin sheet, blocks a direct path between you and the object. So this is going to come into play in this session or in this series of sessions that I'm covering today in this video where there's they're looking for this thing called a black orchid which they're thinking it's a flower but really it's a it's like a, a piece of obsidian or something it's a it's a, a material that's been carved to look like an orchid and I let them fiddle around with the locate object a little bit and they said you know we're looking for a flower or like a an orchid that would be black and you know, I was like, well, you don't you don't sense anything because you know they're they're actually looking for what's basically a little statuette kind of thing of a black orchid. So anyway, all right, that's it for the um, rules, the viewer feedback, and or rules clarification. So let's dig on in to Nangalore. Da, 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 da. So you'll find it starting on page 74 in the book. And it talks about um, the Great Garden. And this is, uh, you'll find the map on page 76. Was built to honor Zalkore, a vain Omuan queen. Its builder... Thyrotaya was Zalkare's foremost general and consort. In their time, their garden was called Kananji, the Hanging Garden of Dreams. So, um, this is just some backstory because there's a Medusa here, and it's kind of telling you where that. And you don't you don't have to know this, but it's interesting. Um, unceasing flattery festered with poisonous vanity in Zalkare's mind. Uh, Unceasing flattery festered with poisonous vanity in Zalkori's mind until she bargained with an Arenas, uh, Arenas to retain her youth and beauty forever. I think an Arenas is, is a demon or a devil. I would have to look that up. Uh, the Arenas fulfilled the deal by trans transforming the queen into a Medusa. When knowledge of her evil bargain spread throughout the realm, the army forced Zalkori to abdicate and exiled her to Kananji, which became ever known became known ever after as Nangalore, the Garden of Lost Dreams. So it went from the Hanging Garden of Dreams to uh, the Garden of Lost Dreams. Lost Dreams. Believing that Thyrutaya was among the generals who exiled her, Zalkori defaced all the statues and portraits of him and Nangalore. She learned he had stayed true to her all his life through decades of imprisonment and disgrace in Omu, only when his ashes were brought to the garden for internment, as was his dying wish. Zakori cultivates hallucinogenic plants in the garden because only in their narcotic lotus dreams can she conjure up the face of her dead love. Um, characters can discover Zalkori's tragic story by interpreting carvings throughout the garden. If that makes them sympathetic toward her, toward her, so be it. But her tragedy didn't ennoble Zakori and make her a better person. It turned into her, turned her into a monster. The Medusa is not alone in the cursed garden. Eblis, which are those sort of sentient humanoid, hum, stork, not quite humanoid beings, um, they serve her as sentinels and spies. Colorful parrots and canaries flock to the garden's great variety of plants some of which are hostile towards visitors, the plants. Finally, brave, brave Chultons sometimes seek out Zalkori as a sort of jungle mystic, uh, either to learn the secrets of her hallucinogenic plans or to ask questions about the distant past. 
Nangalore lies a half mile from the river alone. Thanks to centuries of silting and erosion, one of the river's tributaries floods right up to the Garden Gate, area one on the map of Nangalore, making the site easy to reach by boat. Traveling in Nangalore by foot is a nightmare since the land within one mile is nothing but boggy marsh. Uh, the garden has multiple levels. Uh, the map uses um, elevation markers to indicate how high the level are, levels are relative to the ground, so you want to be aware of that. Uh, some key locations contain multiple levels. For example, Area 4 is 25 feet above ground level with a crumbled 10-foot high balcony and a 20-foot pit deep, which will be 5 feet above ground level. So you got to kind of keep all that in mind. Throughout Nangalore are inscriptions written in Old Omuan. A character with a cloistered scholar or sage background can translate an Old Omuan inscription with a successful DC-10 intelligence history check. A warlock with the eyes of the runekeeper invocation can do so automatically. Otherwise, a comprehend languages, spell, or a similar magic is needed. So, um, so anyway, you have the entrance. Uh, here's the map. You want to uh, keep those elevations in mind. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through like every area of Nangalore. Uh, you know, room by, or area by area, room by room, but it's essentially, essentially, it's essentially, if you look at the map and think about it, it's just an above ground dungeon crawl. It's a, it's a, it's a, once, you, you know, the, the only difference is, except for certain parts, uh, once you get into it, there's, there's no roof. Um, I'm not even sure if there's any parts that have a roof. I can't remember, to be honest, but, you, you can almost think of this as a miniature dungeon crawl. You're just crawling through this, these old hanging gardens that have a Medusa. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, keep in mind that there's this sort of unfolding story that they can learn about the, the love, the tragic love story, uh, the, and then also the vanity that uh, turned uh, the queen into a Medusa. Um, and, and, you know, like you've got uh, narcotic plants that can create hallucinations. Uh, you've got a dead body in here I'll talk about. Uh, you have snakes and you have the eblis. So, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that stuff in a second. I want to I follow up on what an Irenaeus is. I'm pretty sure it's a demon or a devil. So let's, let's look that up just for completion's sake. I'm sorry, Buster. Did I disturb you back there? Just kind of shifting around. D and D Arrhenius. Yeah. Yep. It's a medium fiend devil. Yeah. So she made a deal with a devil, not the devil, but made a deal with the devil. And like most such deals, or all such deals, I should say, uh, it backfired on her. So, uh, I'll give you some notes here on stuff I did. Um, so, the, uh, they were asking us, what does an orchid look like? And I think, you know, with that many players, and, and there's a druid in the mix, they, they, they figured out, you know, it's what a, um, you know, what it would look like, where you would find it on the ground, in the trees, or whatever. And they cast locate object, but that's not going to work if they're saying, I want to find a black orchid. You know, uh, I, I would probably allow it to work if they said, I want to find a carving in this material that looks like a black orchid. I'd probably allow that because that's, you're looking for an object of a type. Other DMs might not allow that. So it's, you know, like locate, locate, placate, placate object locate object is I mean, that that's one of those spells that can drive the players love but can drive dms nuts because it 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 can really you know you're like oh this is gonna be fun while they're searching for that and they're like oh locate object there it is so either you know there, there's ways to get around that uh if they're like you know i i don't mind players casting spells but if they're spamming we cast locate object Go a thousand feet. Cast locate object. Go a thousand feet. Cast locate object. 
I mean, technically, that's there's nothing against the rules about that. But it's it's kind of removing the tension and the fun of the exploration. So if they do that, like even in one session, I'd probably allow it. But if they do it every time, they start just relying on it um, and just spamming it or something. And there's a lot of spells that can be used like this. Uh, then eventually you can say, you know, just plan for it to be more than a thousand feet away or uh, plan for it to be like this. Like they think they're looking for a flower, but in reality they're looking for like a little carving or, or something like that. So, or just put put it uh, put a little bit of lead around it. I think they said even one inch or one whatever. The, the, there was a very small amount of lead that if it's in a direct line, it will block. It's like X like a, Superman's X-ray vision. That's probably what inspired that little nod to that. Um, so anyway, they didn't find it with the locate object spell. Uh, now another thing that kind of confused the players was that when they ran across that tributary from the river that runs right up, like you could literally get in the tributary with a boat and bloop, 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 and, and just bobbing along, bobbing along. I just watched bed knobs and broomsticks over the weekend. So you just bob right along and boom, you come to the gate of Nangalore. They had in their mind, like, oh, we need to cross this tributary instead of follow the tributary. So just, just keep that in mind. Um, so when when and here's some little player moments I like to share. Uh, you know, the, this stuff can come up as a DM. Um, when they got, they're like, okay, we found Nangalore. They're like, we're going to do a short rest because they wanted to get some hit points back and whatever. I, I think they had fought a giant constrictor snake at one point. You know, just kind of a random encounter. Um, so. When they um, when they got there, they long they short rested, uh, and and one player there's always that one player, it's like while they're short resting, I'm gonna sneak up and look around, and there there are four crocodiles at the entrance in the water, uh, it even shows them on the map, um, that he just he he provoked them and got attacked by these four crocodiles. And uh, a couple of the of the players that were short resting refused to help. Um, and, you know, one was even short resting to get hit points back. So they were like, "Look, we're short resting. We need to do this. You ran off. There's always that one player that's going to go poke stuff with a stick. Got yourself in trouble, and we're not helping." And there's multiple sides to that. As a DM, I did not get involved. Uh, but I can, you know, even in a good party of, you know, good play, I can see people going, you know, cause if you have that one player that's just constantly provoking situations, I can see players going, nope, we're not going to help. So oh, let me take my plus three spectacles of viewer feedback and or, uh, rules clarification off. I try not to wear them because of the glare. So, you know, I was just looking up the Irenese thing, which is why I had them on. I wonder, I've got a lot of browsers open over here. I wonder if, let's take some of those off and see if it, it's putting a lot of, see stuff open, something opened up on me when I closed it. And so it popped more light on there when I was trying to, yeah, go away. I'm trying to close stuff and more stuff keeps popping open. Oh, the excitement. Is that too, is that too dark now? I don't know. I think I'll open one of them back up because that does seem a little dark. Okay. That's notepad. I'm using it. I used to, a long time ago, I would use, I would make colored uh, images in a paint program like GIMP and then I would move them around on the monitors to create different colors and stuff but I don't do that anymore so anyway major digression apologies um, so anyway the player survived a couple of the players helped but you know it was interesting like it's really rare for th this group has played together for a long time 
and it's really rare for you to say, no, you're on your own, but that time they were like, you uh, are on your own. And they ended up uh, starting to long rest in the trees. I think after that fight, even, they took a long rest, and um, they were re they got up in the trees uh, since they were so close to Nangalore and in a marsh bog because they're slogging around in the marsh in a bog. Um, so there's that. Uh, let me see if there's any other notes here. And I'll go back to Mangalore and talk a little bit more about that. Um, I introduced the Iren the Eblis, the Eblises, not the Irenius. The Irenius is only a part of the narr the lore for this section, doesn't actually show up. The Eblis are those stork things, those stork creatures. They're intelligent. Um, and they're, they're sort of the Medusa's servants and spies. Uh, I, I, I played them as sort of curious storks because the book it doesn't really say exactly how to use them in Anglor. They're just there. So uh, so the characters saw them watching them more than once. Like, hey, we're noticing these stork things. And I think by that point they were aware enough of uh, Chilton uh, creatures and sentient races and stuff to recognize them as Eblises. Um, and but so they didn't know where they friend or are they foe, you know, whatever. Um, so another thing I, I, I personally have been wanting to introduce the red wizards into this campaign for the players for two reasons. One, uh, the larger meta story of our group is they belong to a, uh, a, an adventuring guild called the Vanguard of the Eye, and if people who've listened to um, other video series that I do, especially I think the White and Plume Mountain one, will know that there's bad blood between the Vanguard of the Eye and the Red Wizards of Fae. So I thought that would be interesting. Um, and then two, uh, later when they actually get to Omu, and you know you get into the last parts of the campaign. Uh, the Red Wizards play a play a factor. Uh, also, I believe that uh, Undril, who was is one of the players, uh, we took Undril the NPC and converted them to a player player character. Uh, has been told to look for and hamper um, the uh, activities of the of the Red Wizards. So I made that dead body that you can that the players can find that's in one of the little garden areas. A, a Red Wizard. Um, of Thay. Now, in, in, in Area 4, there's a big statue and an urn that play a pretty important part. And the the player, the same player that snuck off and provoked the uh, crocodiles messed with the urn, shook up the urn, I think maybe even put their hands in the urn. That was very bad. And the, um, the Eblises saw that. So, um, and that, so that did not work in their favor later. At one point, one of the characters shouted out, we're here for the Black Orchid and Ashara sent us. Ashara is teacher from Cursible. Um, and there's, there's one point, uh, I think in Area 4 again, there's some snakes that can get involved and Druid, and that was my other cat that just meowed, hello. Uh, and, and the Druid used, um, talk with animals to kind of rile up the snakes and I guess get them acting stupidly um, or to keep them from leaving. Um, but anyway, it was using talk with animals uh, on the snakes. Um, and, and, you know, when everything was said and done in Area 4, one swarm of poisonous snakes was killed and the other one was taking off to go snitch to the mistress, the Medusa, about what had happened, plus the Eblises saw it. So keep in mind uh, that uh, much like, um, oh, not much like, I don't know why I was going to say, the urn, that area four, there's a big area in the middle of the map that has like a big statue in it and it has an urn. It's a, be respectful of that. The players need to be respectful of that. Even though they may just want to fight the Medusa no matter what. But that urn that our my party at least really disrespected that urn. <laughs> um, and then a, another note I have here is that uh, like in Firefinger where they're fighting the Terra folk, 
the area you fight the Medusa, her little dome, there's a dome area on the map. I um, can't remember which one it is, maybe number eight. Um, when it's not a good fit for large creatures. And the Eblis, the, the, the little bird stork creatures, are large. Uh, so once again, just like with Firefinger, it's like, they're like, oh, well, you're, you're going to have a big fight in this area. But you have all these large creatures, and it just doesn't, doesn't work. you got to kind of fiddle with it. Um, well, there's my other cat. Hello, cat. I guess she's going to get my lap. So uh, those are some of the notes that I wrote down. So let's uh, let me look through the uh, the book and, and see what else I can point out for you here that'll be helpful with Nangalore. Okay, so I need to <laughs> walk some stuff back. I don't know where I got myself confused. Uh, in my notes, I wrote when they cast locate object. So one player cast locate object spell and looked for quote black orchid un unquote but but described a flower. So no result. And in my mind, I was thinking, I don't know why I, I was thinking this, but uh, I was thinking the black orchid was a, a decorative object. But it's actually a real black orchid. And for some reason, I guess it only, either it only grows in Nangalore, or uh, that's the only one where the teacher, Ashara, the Arakokra, knew definitely where it was at. Uh you know, and I went and looked back at Curse, Curse of All, and, you know, it said that she didn't want to send her air croaker there because the, the Eblis can be really dangerous. These, you know, evil stork things, cranes, intelligent crane things. Um, and, and there is a uh, black orchid growing in a pot in the Medusa's layer chambers so why i had myself i'm sorry just you know sorry for confusing you but it is actually a uh a plant uh that uh teacher wants to grind into powder as part of a of, of a ritual so i don't know why i had that in my head and let me look at the map i'm not sure why i had the locate object failed i i probably came up with some weird reason why it would fail so that they wouldn't find it immediately because I'm looking and you know uh, 5 10 15 20 25 30 35 yeah I mean the, the whole map here is less than a thousand feet so why they didn't find it I guess I I did some weird loophole from the way they were describing it said oh you don't you don't find anything I don't know anyway it's a plant so uh, keep in mind there's eblises around here there's musk creepers uh, that can be kind of nasty. There's in the when you're in the garden. There's all these um, discoveries on a D20. Anything from flying monkeys to jaculies to uh, assassin vines to chwingas, and then one of the results is the rotting corpse of a human mage. Um, and that and that that corpse has a folding boat, which is a nice magic item. So I think I just had them find that one instead of it being a random result. Um, you have these these areas. You got you got giant spiders. You got chwingas, those cute little jungle spirit things. Um, you know you got, and then you have the eblises, which can be nasty. And then you've got a medusa. So as, and and then you have um, hallucinogenic plants that can um, you know if they fail their save, they they can get poisoned. Um, in in they can not only get poisoned by the plants, but then they become charmed by every other creature in Nangalore. So, um, I think there's musk. There's man traps. Um, there's a man trap. There are all kinds of stuff in here. Eblis, uh, you know, so kind of bone up on the different kind of monsters they can run in. Yeah, there's musk zombies. Not, uh, and there's a musk, yellow musk creeper there's man trap uh, a couple of different man traps so just kind of set you up on those creatures before they go cruising through here and of course you'll want to be aware of the um, of the final confrontation which is with the adusa with the adusa with the medusa which is zalcore um, that's an area eight which is a dome 
one of those little dome areas, and it's a single large chamber. Inside the dome is obviously a royal apartment, or was centuries ago. Now the bright floral murals are dim and gray. Bits of colored glass are heaped beneath a cracked mosaic. Enameled wooden tables are split and tilting, and every bit of cloth is frayed and streaked. At the center of the room, a long divan, or divan, 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 stands atop a circular dais. Reclining on the divan, a couch kind of thing, is a woman dressed in a flowing robe made from parrot feathers in stunning colors. Despite the heat, her arms, head, and face are covered in feathery veils. Next to her, a black orchid grows out of a large clay pot at the head of, a, at the, head of the divan. Of the Devon. She addresses you in a voice tinged with odd inflections. Strangers have come to Nangalore, my love. What boon do our subjects beseech? Like she's talking to somebody. Uh, the Medusa isn't completely insane, but thanks to her plant extract, she continually hallucinates that Thyrotyra, that general who loved her, uh, is standing at her side. Most of Zalcori's comments include him somehow, trying to make these references as puzzling as possible for the characters. She also believes that she's still queen of Omu while simultaneously remembering and understanding she was exiled here. She can make contradictory statements about herself and her past without any apparent cognitive dissonance. So even though they say she isn't completely insane, she ain't completely sane either. Um, characters can have a pleasant, some pleasant, pleasant, somewhat informative encounter with Zalkori if they abide by three conditions. Let's look at these. The first one is disturbing Thyrotyra's ashes or damaging his statue are unpardonable. If characters did either, then a fight to the death is guaranteed. So the party that I'm DMing, guaranteed fight because the one player messed with the ashes. Also, in that chamber, number four, where, these, uh, where the statue in the urn is, there's also a smaller statue of... Um, Let's see if I can find the description of it. Um, there's a large giant warrior statue, and standing to one side of the giant warrior is another statue, this one much smaller, exquisitely lifelike. Uh, it depicts a man reaching for the urn, his face turned towards the balcony. In his lifeless eyes, you see terror. So that's somebody that was literally in an, an old Omuan scratched... Um, into the floor next to this smaller statue, which is somebody turned to stone by the Medusa, it's in old Omu, and it says, once a thief, forever a slave. So that's a hint that there's a Medusa if they don't already know that there's a Medusa. That's a big hint. Because when they first walk into Area 8, where she's chilling on her big couch, everything's all covered up. It's just, it's just a woman as far as they know. So, but my group walked into a guaranteed battle because they had messed with the ashes. All right, so the next thing is, uh, out of these three, first, don't mess with the ashes or damage the statue. Just don't do it. Next thing is, the first time someone makes a disparaging remark about Thiru Tyra or refers to his betrayal, they draw a furious response from Zalkori, but she recomposes herself. If it happens a second time, a battle is assured. If someone snatches away Zalkori's veil, makes a grab for the black orchid, or brings out a mirror, their fate is sealed. If someone asks why she wears a veil, Zalkori replies that she no longer desires to show, desires to show her true face to anyone but her beloved Thyrotyra. As long as the meeting remains cordial, Zalkori can reveal much about Omu. She can direct characters to its general location, between the fire peaks and the great iron mine of the dwarves, and warns them that Wan Ti covet the city. She knows nothing about the soulmonger or the death curse. She's heard that at least one of her descendants is in hiding with the bird folk of Curse of All, awaiting the restoration of the monarchy. This is true, the two royal children are there. These are examples of how Zakori simultaneously thinks of herself as still the ruling queen of Omu as it was centuries ago, uh, but also where the city has fallen and he's in exile. Both situations coexist, coexist in their hallucinatory reality. The Black Orchid. 
Characters in Search of a Black Orchid for Ashara's Ritual. See Curse of All, page 68. We already talked about that a little bit. Find one here, but Zalkori won't part with it unless the characters offer her something of equal beauty. As payment, she demands a gemstone, a piece of jewelry, or an art object worth at least 500 gold pieces. She won't accept lesser quality goods of equal value. Zalkori is also attracted to characters with a charisma of 16 or higher, and will accept one such character as a slave in exchange for the flower. The black orchid in Zalkori's possession is the only one to be found in Angalor. Finally, poisonous hospitality. If Zalkori resolves to kill the character, characters over an offense, but the situation is still more or less cordial, she offers food and drink. She rings a silver handbell. ding a ding a ding a Do you like that? ding a ding a ding And an Eblis servant. And you can find the stats for the Eblis in Appendix D, by the way. Arrives with a tray of fruit and wine. All of it is artfully drugged. The contamination can be detected only by someone who has proficiency in medicine and who succeeds on a DC 13 wisdom medicine check. Zakori partakes, but she's built up such a tolerance that this dose won't affect her. Characters who eat or drink must make a successful DC 15 constitution saving throw or be poisoned for one hour or until they drink two quarts of water. Okay, finally... If a fight breaks out, which it's D&D, &D, so let's be honest, a fight's probably going to break out. Um, you know, I had uh, the Eblises come to help her. And then, you know, of course, she's a Medusa, which is no small thing. Uh, when Zalkori is reduced to 63 hit points or fewer, she calls out to her dead lover for protection. The spirit of Thyru Tyra answers the call, appearing as a barely visible 10-foot-tall apparition of a Chultan warrior wielding a massive spear of force. The apparition is impervious to damage and spells and can't be turned or controlled. It looms above Zalkori until she dies or regains all her hit points. Once per turn, when a creature within 15 feet of Zalkori damages her, Thyru Tyra's apparition can unerringly Unerringly hits the attackers, it's like a magic missile, it just hits, with its spear dealing 2d8 plus 6 or 15 average force damage to that creature. Uh, and then there's a little descript description um, of treasure, including um, her little tincture, her hallucinatory tincture and involving constitution saving throws and lesser restoration and all that stuff. So, there you go. That's basically Nangalore. And again, I had the Iblis jump in. Because the, uh, I think I had, I think there's six of them in the, in Nangalore. Maybe I'm wrong. Let's see here. Nangalore. Nangalore. Did I lose my place for Nangalore? I think I did. Uh, are there six Iblis running around? Uh for some reason, I'm thinking six. Four crocodiles, man trap, Gilmas. And remember, there's all these areas throughout Nangalore that tell the, the tell the unfolding tragedy of her and her. I didn't go through that with a fine tooth comb with you. You know, you obviously want to kind of read on it. I'm just giving you some of the high points. Swarms of quipper, uh, twingas, swarms of. Well, how many darn Eblises are there? I don't know. I said six, but I don't know where I got that from. I'm sure it's in here somewhere. It's probably blazingly obvious. Um, and I can't see it now. I know this is fascinating for you. So I'm not gonna. I'm gonna pause the video. All right, here we go. Uh, area six is a pagoda, and it says it houses six eblis. Again, see appendix D uh, that serve as Alcor's sentries and servants. So, uh, unless the characters creep through the garden with uncommon stealth, the eblis see or hear them coming. In which case, this nest will be empty. Three eblis move to Zalkori's lair. Area eight. We just talked about that. While the others take up positions in trees, on walls, or on rooftops. Their job is not to attack the intruders on sight, but to alert Zalkori and be ready to back up whatever she does. So, yeah, I had six Eblis jump into the fight. So, there we go. Anyway, that's it for this session of Tomb of Annihilation. Um, 
And thanks so much for watching, as always. I appreciate it. And we will catch you next time on Shane Place.